Okay. Welcome to the 2023 Richard M. Dorison Lecture. I'm Praveena Shukla. I'm the current chair of the Department of Folklore and Ethnomusicology. Before I introduce this year's speaker, I want to remind everybody there's a reception at the Folklore Department right after the, uh, the lecture. Every single person is uh, invited, so please cross this. This lecture is named after Richard Dorson. Dorson was the most important folklorist of his era, diverse in his skills and his talents. A good administrator, he consolidated and expanded the Department of Folklore at Indiana University. Though he was interested in oral literature, he expanded the department to include both ethnomusicology and material culture. Though he was himself an Americanist, he built an international department. A successful teacher, Dorson directed the dissertation of many of the leaders of the next generation. As a writer, he used his few work to create an early and important book, Bloodstoppers and Bear Walkers, and two collections of African American folk tales. As a writer, he also used his historical understanding to write two popular books on American folklore. As a skilled editor, his great monument was the Folk Tales of the World series, which built a consistent anthology of the folk tales of many countries of the world. As an editor, he created the book Folklore and Folk Life, a master survey of the state of folklore study in his time. I would like to acknowledge three members of the Dorson family who are in attendance right now, his sons, Roland and Jeff, and his daughter-in-law, Patty. We're all here, and they will be joining us at the reception. So please come and talk to them if you have any memories of uh, Dick Dorson. This endowed lecture brings prominent folklorists to our campus to deliver a public talk and to engage with, folk, with students and faculty. Previous Dorsen lecturers include Roger Abrams, Margaret Mills, Carl Lindahl, Charles Briggs, Patricia Turner, Regina Bendix, Dan Benamos, who we lost a few weeks ago, Dorothy Noyes, Tom Mould, who just walked in, is in the audience. <laughs> Barbara Kirschenbach Gimblet and Terry Gunn. This year's Dorsen lecture is Dr. Maggie Holtzberg, who was a man who, who is the manager of the Folk Arts and Heritage Program at Mass Cultural Council. Maggie is the, an elected fellow of the American Folklore Society and the winner of the 2018 Benjamin A. Bobkin Prize for a career of distinguished for a distinguished career in public folklore. She has a bachelor's degree in ethnomusicology from Wesleyan University in ethnomusicology. That's important. Her MA and PhD are from the University of Pennsylvania in folklore, and Henry Glassie directed her dissertation. Maggie has dedicated herself to studying, documenting, recording, filming, producing, exhibiting, and writing about traditional arts and artists. She's equally devoted to music as she is to craft. She has documented traditions in Alabama, in Georgia, and Massachusetts. Here are some highlights. In Alabama, Maggie conducted field work throughout the state, recording the stories and work calls of retired railroad workers known as Gandy Dancers. In 1994, she co-directed and co-produced the film Gandy Dancers, which aired on PBS and was an award winner of the Margaret Mead Film Festival. Maggie successfully nominated Gandy Dancers John Meelan and Cornelius Wright for the NEA National Heritage Fellowship in 1996. As a folk, folk life program director with the Georgia Council on the Arts, Maggie, Maggie helped direct the Georgia Folk Life Grant Program and the Traditional Arts Apprenticeship Program. She produced a material album, musical album, Georgia Folk, a Sampler of Traditional Sounds, which was chosen by the Library of Congress for inclusion in the American Folk Music and Folklore Recordings, a selected list. At the Mass Cultural Council's Folk Art and Heritage Program, Maggie continues to promote public understanding of the state's traditional arts and heritage, developing a centralized archive and traditional arts database, and administering the traditional arts apprenticeship program. Keepers of Tradition, Art and Folk Heritage in Massachusetts is one of Maggie's most important contributions to the discipline of folklore. 
The 2008 exhibition curated by her featured 100 works by over 70 artists working in crafts, music, dance, and sacred arts. The accompanying publication, Keepers of Tradition, reached an audience beyond those that saw the exhibition, providing a perfect instance of the interchange between public and academic work. The book models the importance of close ethnographic fieldwork, documenting the process of making and the value of internships aided by folk arts agencies for the maintenance of traditional arts. Maggie's accessible and excellent book displays what folklorists do best, showcase a variety of voices, peoples, and genres, democratically adding them to the historical record. I signed the book in my graduate folk art class. As a state folklorist of Massachusetts, Maggie has made it possible for several artists to receive the prestigious NEA National Heritage Fellowship, including, I'm going to read these names, Irish button accordionist Joe Doreen, Master Shipwright Harold Burnham, Cambodian ceramicist Yari Levan, Irish fiddler Seamus Connolly, and Malian de Jelly player Bala Kayuti. In total, Maggie has successfully nominated seven National Heritage Award winners. I'm going to say that again. She has nominated seven people who have won the NEA National Heritage Award. When everybody else now spends much too much time self-promoting their own work, Maggie has spent time celebrating other people. Her loyalty to her discipline, her dedication to the artists she works with, her contributions to public folklore, combined with her career of accomplishments through films, audio recordings, exhibitions, archival collections, publications, and public programs, exemplify the power of public folklore to reach the general public while celebrating traditional arts and artists. It is with pride that I offer to you this year's uh, Dorsum Lecture, Maggie Holstern. Well, thank you, Praveena, and thank you to the faculty for inviting me to this amazing opportunity. Um, I am going to be showing slides. There's one case where there's a blank, and I'm just going to tell you that so you know it's not like, oops. <laughs> um, so, so many traditions, so little time, reflections of a state folklorist. It is an honor for me to be here with you this afternoon. Preparing this lecture has been a chance to reflect on 34 years of working as a public folklorist. I gather that some of the students in the Department of Folklore and Anthropology plan to go into this type of work, and I encourage you, it has been even more gratifying I could have imagined. I begin by inviting you directly into the work, choosing two stars of tradition, 11th generation wooden boat builder Harold Burnham and hereditary musician Bala Kuyate. Much of our field research focuses on living traditions with a link to the past, and one could not find a better example than the Sosa Bala, a West African musical instrument which since the 13th century has been under the guardianship of the Kuyate family. Pictured here is Bala's father, El Haj Sekou Kuyate, who until his passing in 2022 was the current guardian of the instrument. The Sosa Bala is revered as the Ur Bala form. It's kept in a sacred hut and is brought out to be played only twice a year. As Bala says, there are a million people out there that think of this instrument as a xylophone or a vibraphone, but this here is the ancestor of all of those. Baba Kuyate has lived in Massachusetts since 2001, and it was his familial tie to the Sosa Bala that got me thinking about the upkeep and use of highly valued cultural objects. Hearing him talk about the Sosa Bala led me to question Western concepts of authenticity and the meaning of original in objects made of perishable materials. These same issues resonated when talking with Harold Burnham about the Sylvina Beale, a storied wooden hull fishing tender with 110 consecutive years of service. 
Both objects hold deep cultural significance in their respective communities of maritime New England and the Monday heartland of West Africa. I hadn't thought much about the primacy Western conservation practice places on identifying and conserving original materials until I was invited to speak to Michelle Marincolo's conservation class at NYU's Institute of Fine Arts. The field of conservation, with its focus on fine art and architectural heritage, grew out of material science, hence its emphasis on tangible over intangible value. But from Harold and Bala, I've learned that the working knowledge of how to build, refurbish, and use these objects matters far more than the originality of their materials. This knowing by doing gets at the core of what energizes us as folklorists. Over the years, Mass Cultural Council has supported Bala with an artist fellowship, a traditional arts apprenticeship grant, and that's his son, Sekou, named after his father, um, <clears throat> and with opportunities to perform at concerts and national folk festivals. In 2019, Bala was awarded a National Heritage Fest Fellowship. And with this award came funding to make a short film. Daniel Jacobs shot and edited the excerpt I will now share with you. So let Sorry. So I was born in a town called Nyanasola, which is in the border between Mali and Guinea. And uh, I grew up in the capital, I grew up in the Bamako. The family I was born to, uh, uh, the Kuyati family, uh, and we're the first Jolly the peacemaker, and we're the keeper of the everybody history. So the French people call us Grillo. The first Grillo was a Bala Faseke, Kuyati, and I'm the directly descendant from Bala Faseke. The Bala has been in my family for 800 years. And my father was a guardian of that first bottle phone, which had been passing down generation to generation. I started finding this instrument when I was six. And in early teenager age, I become kind of like, you know, famous around in town. And then people started uh, inviting me to the farm. They would come to my family, to my dad or to my mom. Say, hey, I have 10 or 20 a uh, guy who's going to come work in my farm. So I want your son to come to farm for them, to motivate them for work. We have the particular song for that moment. While I'm playing the rhythm, my mom keeping the beat, and then those workers go with the music at the same time. So that rhythm will go with a work movement. So I will do that all day long, the whole season before May. It was my dad, before my dad, it was his dad. So it just been going on generation to generation. So I want to make sure my kid also following that tradition. But since my son was uh, six months old, since he can see that, I had this tiny baby bottle for him. And he would just be banging on it. So the bigger his kid, and the bigger bottle for him, I'm for him. So he played the bottle for him, taught him. And my daughter as well, she played the bottle for him. She sings, she dances. What the general public wouldn't know is how deeply committed Bala is to serving his own community. He upholds the family jelly tradition of playing for weddings, baptisms, and other domestic ceremonies within the West African immigrant communities, reminding people far from home of where they came from. It doesn't matter if you do it in Africa or you do it in over here. It doesn't matter if I'm playing here with Yo Yo Ma or Bella Fleck. I said, go there. I will spend eight hours outside playing for the wedding or playing for, you know, the shower. Because we want to maintain that tradition. <clears throat> Over the years, oh, sorry, ethnomusicologist Eric Cherry did extensive field research in Mali with the Kuyate clan. He notes that, quote, the preservation of such a musical instrument is extraordinary. It may be one of the oldest instruments preserved in Africa south of the Sahara, if not the very oldest. 
So the Sola Tabala is one of the defining symbols of the 13th century founding of the Mande Empire. It plays a vital role in the Sujata epic poem, a cycle of narratives transmitted orally from generation to generation by members of the jelly cast of hereditary musicians. Legend holds that the very first balafone was created by supernatural beings. When Sunjata Kita came to power in 1235 AP, he took the balafone as a war trophy and appointed the Kuyate family to protect the instrument. They've done so ever since. I've been wondering about the Mande meaning of original in this oft-told legend. How could a 13th century musical instrument made of rosewood and gourds survive 800 years, considering that the only way to tune it is to chisel away parts of the individual keys? What could possibly be left? When I asked Bala if it literally is the same instrument, he acknowledges that it's been repaired before declaring it's exactly the same one. In 2001, UNESCO recognized it as an object of intangible cultural heritage meriting safeguard. Well, Eric Cherry had asked similar questions of his host, Jamari Kuyate, who casually noted that pieces had probably been fixed, such as new gourds or keys, and that indeed there may not be a single item on the instrument that goes back that far. But Jamari didn't seem to think that was a big deal. Eric took this as common sense, saying, quote, Bala's need repair. Thinking it through like that, I like that African concept. It's a living instrument. It needs upkeep. And in that process, perhaps everything has been replenished many times over. And why should that be an issue? We here in the West apply similar reasoning to historically valued objects made of organic materials. Consider the USS Constitution, also known as Old Ironsides. The oldest commissioned naval vessel still afloat. Launched in 1797, she is a wooden hulled, three masted heavy frigate of the US Navy. And even though only 9 to 12 percent of the original vessel is still intact. Old Ironsides is revered and visited annually by thousands of maritime historians, school children, and tourists from around the world. The dating of objects is a major concern for most of us in the West. We seem hardwired to verify when an object was made, to identify what is original, and note what has been altered or replaced. For archaeologists, museum curators, and art conservators, the concept of time is measured and interpreted using radiometric dating, artifact typologies, and by recording dimensions to within millimeter precision. Other cultures measure time differently. Visual anthropologist and filmmaker Winnie Lambrecht was raised in the Dem Democratic Republic of the Congo, where she observed a different attitude toward objects and conservation, saying, it's not the object itself. It's the spirit that's embedded in the object. The object is the material embodiment of the spirit and the tradition. So at issue is approaching the conservation of an object in the archaeological sense versus the instrument as a mutable object innately tied to a living tradition. Which brings us back to the veal, whose original parts have mostly succumbed to the harshness of working along the New England coast for over 100 years. Until recently, this historically significant vessel lay listing half sunk in the Tidal Creek beside Harold Burnham's boatyard in Essex, Massachusetts. In 2018, after buying the field, Harold and his partner Mary Kay sailed her down from Bar Harbor, Maine. She was no longer structurally sound. Harold described the sail as terrifying saying, she shifted in the waves, moving like a fish in water. What lay ahead was the complete rebuilding of her hull structure from keel to deck. And the goal was to get Coast Guard certified to run passenger charters. I defer to Harold to describe the Beale's significance by sharing another film excerpt. go back in Essex to 1635, even though I'm the current generation that's running the shipyard here, the history is not something that I alone possess. It's shared at least equally with almost everyone in this town, and if you start to include the fishing, almost everyone in this area, 
there's a historic marker that says that the adjacent acre of land was set aside by the town fathers in 1668 for the men of Essex to build ships and employ workmen to that end. The first and foremost requirement of any wooden ship builder is experience on the water. The more experience you have on the water, the more you're able to form opinions about construction, engineering, sales, balance, how deep it's got to be, or how stable it's got to be, and then having an understanding of the medium you're working in, you know, how to form it in such a way that it, it will function, pull together, and be safe. It was a very lucky thing when Tom Ellis came to hire me to build the land. And I was 29 years old. I had worked and played building boats my whole life and had a lot of experience as a professional mariner working with Coast Guard regulations and studying boat design. But what was unique to me at the time was I was able to ask people who had worked in the old shipyards building sawn frame and other types of boats as well. And a few old timers who had actually done the heavy construction that I could go to. Thankfully, they were able to come down and show us what to do and tell us what to do. And we were able to get first-hand oral history and first-hand experience out of people who today aren't any longer with us. The Savina W. Beale was built in 1911 by Frank C. Adams in East Booth Bay, Maine. It was built as a herring fishing schooner. It was restored to its auxiliary sail configuration and then worked in the passenger industry and the waterfronts all along the New England coast for over 100 years. What the Beale needs at this point is a complete rehabilitation of the entire hull structure from the keel to the deck. What we're saving is largely the stories that form what she is. And not long from now, we'll give future generations an opportunity to form their own stories with that same boat that's been running for 110 years. It's just an honor to be involved with it. It's worth noting that when Harold um, was awarded the National Heritage Fellowship in 2012, he and a small crew sailed a, another of his schooners, the Ardell, uh, down to Washington from, from the festivities. And it, it, it was a rough fall. It was, it was a rough sail. It was the first time it ever strapped in. Uh, last November, I was among those invited to the Beale Necropsy, a post-mortem examination of the vessel. Attendees included underwater archaeologists, ship model makers, arborists, Coast Guard members, and Essex Shipbuilding Museum staff and volunteers. Harold described the event as a unique opportunity to take apart a living shipwreck. Why bother, you might wonder? Because documenting her lines, recording plank widths, examining watertight seals on bulkheads, and other construction details will inform the reconstruction of her, providing data for future generations. Typically, marine archaeologists must infer everything that shipbuilders intended from underwater archaeological remains. In the Beals case, the wreck is still at Buckwater. Dave Robinson, who had been working on site with Harold, addressed the crowd, saying, I've learned a tremendous amount about the way shipwrights think about ships versus the way we think about them as archaeologists, just in the documentation we've done in the last few weeks. And it's going to be what I apply to the archaeology I do from here on. Months later, wondering why Dave was so moved by Harold's approach to documentation, I asked him to elaborate, and he offered an apt analogy. The ship remains that survive in the archaeological record are often broken apart and jumbled, incomplete and degraded. Imagine trying to do a puzzle without the puzzle box's lid picture to guide you with 75% of the pieces missing. And the ones that you do have are all damaged after getting chewed on by the family dog. <laughs> so if a shipwreck is an incomplete puzzle, having a shipwright's perspective and knowledge 
can help fill in some of the puzzle pieces, rendering archaeological inference unnecessary. Hence Dave's resolution to approach documentation through the functional lens of a shipwreck. In documenting what is left of the beetle, burning the remains in the wood stove, and reconstructing her with entirely new materials, will she be the same ship? The disassembly of the beetle recalls the Japanese tradition of periodically dismantling temples to maintain the practical knowledge of how to construct them. Barbara Kirshenblatt Gimlet references this practice saying, in order to recover the knowledge, you actually have to materialize it. It's only in rebuilding that you can transmit the knowledge of how to rebuild it for future generations of craftsmen. For them, the original material of the wooden object is not what the value lies. The Sosabala is valued not because its original materials have been preserved, but because it is the material embodiment of a living tradition maintained by performance. Similarly, the beel is valued not because its original materials will be preserved, but because by deconstructing, rebuilding, and sailing her, skills are transferred and a region will remain connected to its shipbuilding and fishing heritage. The human-to-human -human transmission of how to build, maintain, and use an object is where true value lies. This is for the students. <laughs> I attended graduate school in the 1980s, a time when the University of Pennsylvania's Department of Folklore and Folklife was in its prime. A third of us, and I, I have to mention that Diane and Bonnie are in this picture doing a mock play. A third of our class would go on to work at federal agencies, museums, cultural organizations, state arts agencies, and humanities councils. When it came time for me to seek employment, I was fortunate that Bess Lomax Hobbs was well into her tenure as director of folk and traditional arts at the National Endowment for the Arts. With political savvy and passion, Bess helped establish folk art programs in 50 of the 56 states and territories of the country. She was personally invested in the success of every state folk work position, including Georgia, where I was living at the time and moving into a PhD. Aside from a few years as an independent contract folk artist, I've worked at state arts agencies. It's a calling and privilege that has allowed me to get to know, learn from, and support a remarkable range of traditional artists and culture bearers. In the Deep South, they included old-time fiddlers, shape note singers, and dandy dancers, family dynasties of wood fire potters, makers of peace quilts, and sweet grass baskets. Returning north to Massachusetts in 1999, I was struck by how much more ethnically diverse the population seemed. Multi-generational communities of indigenous, Irish, Italian, French Canadians, Portuguese, Greeks, Cape Verdeans, and newly arrived immigrants settling into diasporic communities from Mali, Cambodia, and Nepal. I would soon discover that some of the most recent immigrants and refugees brought with them some of the most ancient traditions. Looking back has me wondering why I, as many in our field, am drawn to someone else's folklore, repertoires, and traditions. Keenly aware when they're on the cusp of being lost. Why have I devoted my life to documenting and sharing other people's cultural practices and not my own? Speculating a guess, I would say it's because I'm strangely distanced from my own cultural Raised without formal religious education, I identify as a secular Jew. Although I have fond memories of attending Passover seders, I've never stayed home on a, or I've never stayed home from work on a Jewish holiday. With the unknowingness of my ancestors' uh, stories, for instance, my great grandfather was a cantor in Russia, but that's about all I know. Um, cultural transmission has been broken, perhaps lacking a sense of belonging has made the belongingness of others more compelling. The seeds of my elected affinity were planted in childhood through books and recordings in our family home. A 1958 edition of the Jacktail stood nestled amongst a collection of folk song books 
In the acknowledgement of Ruth Crawford Seeger's American Folk Songs for Children, Seeger credits the Silver Spring Cooperative Nursery School uh, <coughs> in Maryland as the school in which the book began to grow. I attended that nursery school as a four-year-old. During the six months our family lived in the D.C. area, while my father served on President Eisenhower's Science Advisory Committee. I still have my parents' final records of Lead Belly, Wood Guthrie, Woody Guthrie, Gene Ritchie, and those early LPs edited by Alan Lomax, their very titles giving away the era in which they were produced, like Afro-American Blues and Game Songs from the Archive of American Folk Song. The impulse to collect started early. Let me share an origin story of sorts. I was 10 when our family took a road trip from New York to the Blue Ridge Mountains. We stayed at Fontana Village, a vacation resort in Fontana Dam, North Carolina. While there, we met and befriended groundskeeper Fred Nichols. And when he learned I played the violin, he eagerly shared some folk songs from his repertoire with us. I still have his letter. There it is. <laughs> sure, it was nice meeting you people. Hope we meet again. And included were handwritten lyrics to Chicken in the Bread Tray, Picking Up Dough, four other songs, and a humorous tale he'd written about his gal style who lives in Moonshine Holler. Fred signed off writing, Hope Maggie can substitute a tune for these little songs. I haven't had time yet to see some of the old folks, which I think I can get several real old songs from. When I do, we'll send them to you. God bless you in my prayers, Fred. Over 50 years later, I still have his letter, Ever the Archivist. <laughs> Collecting, recording, and preserving primary sources became a lifelong practice, with key mentors along the way. During my second semester in college, I interned with Joe Hagerson at the Archive of Folk Song, which gave me the chance to roam the library stacks and update a bibliography on fiddle tune collections. It was an opportune, opportune time to be there. Congressional hearings were taking place on the establishment of a National Folk Life Center. Amongst those I heard testifying were Archie Green, Elizabeth Liva Cotton, a freight train frame, and cowboy musician and songwriter Glenn Orland. Two years later, Congress passed the American Folk Life Preservation Act, establishing the American Folk Life Center. Fiddling has been a through line with fondness for regional styles of New England, Appalachia, Ireland, and Scotland. During a junior year abroad, I spent three months in the Shetland Islands studying with fiddle legend Tom Anderson. Upon return, I transferred to West Wing University for their ethnomusicology program. A part-time job in the university archives and special collections was foundational. Archivist Elizabeth Swain instilled good work habits and taught me how to process manuscript materials. Lessons learned from professors and graduates <laughs> continue to resonate. What great fortune it was to have Henry Glassie for issues in folklore my first semester at the University of Pennsylvania. He brought the discipline of folklore to life, setting a fine example of how to recognize centers of culture and their individual stars, bringing them into the historical record in their own words. Glassie's search for how excellence in art is locally defined guides my work to this very day. Ray Berkowitz's lectures and living room assignments taught many of us to be better folklorists. One of my favorites is his caveat, don't ask expensive questions if you can't afford the answers. <laughs> <laughs> Arch Green inspired me to study occupational folklore and champion the work, uh, the stories of working people. <coughs> Why choose public folklore? For me, it's about preferred audience. Hold on, I love you all. <laughs> <laughs> Back in the 1980s, UPenn didn't really prepare us for work in the public sector. The best way to learn was from those who had been doing the work, especially at that time. Upon graduation, I relocated to the Deep South, and there I found a collegial network of public folklorists who met regularly, annually, at Folklorists in the South retreats. One of my first contracts was with Alabama State folklorist Joey Brackner. In addition to getting to accompany a gifted field worker who knows his state is only a native can, I got a passenger seat view of running a folk arts program based in the State Arts Agency. 
This included managing artist fellowships and apprenticeship grants, miles and miles of driving in a state-issued rental, Joey spinning tobacco juice along the way, <laughs> truly learning on the job. Uh, it was during my time in Alabama, funded by an NEA grant to document traditional music, that Joey and I sought out and interviewed nine retired black railroad track laborers who had some work chance to synchronize their movements while winding track, and that led eventually to the making of the documentary film mentioned earlier, Gandhi Dancers. I learned early on that to be a public folklorist at a state arts agency necessitates being a generalist rather than a specialist. In 1972, Warren E. Roberts wrote, it's a rare field worker who is equally competent in recording the techniques of a folk craft and the music of a fiddle tune. But that's exactly what the job requires. Our field work and grant giving must be responsive to those who live in the state and what they value. And this means familiarizing yourself with a boundless array of cultural traditions while acquiring just enough knowledge to express genuine interest keenest to learn more, and most importantly, have the sense to ask relevant questions. Being a state folklorist is a great job for someone who doesn't like doing the same thing every day. The position necessitates the wearing of many hats. Ethnographic field worker, photographer, filmmaker, archivist, producer, writer, advocator, grants administrator, presenter, and exhibit curator. As the only folklorist on staff, at a state arts agency, I sometimes find my coworkers envious of my freedom. While they manage grant programs and provide services, I regularly get out to visit with people carrying on traditions of locally significance, defined as significance, like Cambodian potter Yari Levon firing ware in an arched woodburn kiln. Imagine attending the side launch of a newly built schooner, watching a Caribbean carnival procession or going underground with tunnel workers local 88 during Boston's big dig. What's not to like? <laughs> Documentary field work, who should do it and for who? When contracting ethnographic field research, those of us in state folk folklore positions typically hire degreed folklorists and ethnomusicologists. But the requirement of advanced degrees for this work is being questioned by some arts administrators, academics, and culture bearers. I share a recent experience. Last fall, I attended a NASA, everybody knows that's the National Assembly of State Arts Agencies. Okay, it was a pre-conference for folk arts coordinators who hold positions at state arts agencies. And one of the invited speakers was Silver Moon LaRose, assistant director of the Tomacaw Museum in Rhode Island. She introduced herself this way. In my community, I would consider myself a maker, a culture bearer, an auntie, a protector of land, and a storyteller. None of those things pays the bills." Unquote. Her experience was that to be considered an expert by the dominant culture, she needed to have a diploma or call herself an artist, folklorist, or curator. Quote, folklorists do this work for others, she said. Um, <clears throat> Indigenous people do it for ourselves. Folklorists become experts, and indigenous people become sources." Unquote. Then, addressing the folklorists, ethnomusicologists, and arts administrators in the room, Silver Moon asked, why are you doing this work? Who asked for this? Who is it for? Who reaps the benefits? And who is empowered? In other words, she asked the expensive questions. The ones you don't ask unless you can afford the answers. The idea that field work by outsiders can be extracted and exploitative, the ethnographer as well-intentioned colonialist, is not new. But it seems to be gaining wider recognition within academia and the public sector. Some think we should step aside and only support culture-specific communities to do their own cultural documentation. Perhaps, but must it be either or? Given a mutual passion for carrying traditional knowledge forward, could it be that we all benefit from collaborating? Concerning field work done by outsiders, I'm going to share another, an alternative view. Elizabeth James Perry is an enrolled member of the Aquina Wampanoag Tribal Nation. She's highly regarded within her community and beyond for revitalizing Eastern Woodlands Algonquian traditional arts 
including hand-sculpted wampum beads shaped from locally harvested cohog shells, soft fiber basketry, and ancient forms of finger woven wampum for belts, collars, and round medallions. Using local plants, she's revived natural dye techniques to create a traditional palette for her work. Elizabeth's artistry draws on family knowledge, scholarly research, and the mentoring she's received from community elders. One of these elders was Gladys Wittes, a tribal leader, historian, and potter known for her variegated clay pots made from the sandy clay of Gayhead Cliffs off Martha's Vineyard. Gladys, who passed away in 2012, was one of the Wampanoag community members interviewed by the Smithsonian in preparation for the 1988 American Festival of Folklife. Forty field workers had spread throughout the state in search of potential festival participants. Copies of their field research are housed in the Massachusetts State Archives, including a handwritten note by Ben Mullanis, tape log. It describes time spent with Gladys as they drove to various locations on the western end of the vineyard. I told Elizabeth about the interviews done with her members of her community more than three decades ago. After sending her a copy of the tape log, she wrote back immediately saying, how amazing. I read through those notes and I felt like I was with Gladys again for a moment. I look forward to finding those tapes. This is who the work is for. And to support other efforts, like nominating individuals for National Heritage Fellowships, of which Elizabeth James Perry is a recipient this year. The ability to conduct documentary field research has long been a required skill in public folklore's job descriptions. Program managers around the country have accumulated collections of field reported interviews and images, both still and moving. Yet many lack the training to properly process and preserve these materials. This is indeed regrettable, especially if the field research is intended for future use by the communities whose traditions and expressive cultures have been documented. I was introduced to the basics of archival best practice at Westland <coughs> Olin Library. Oh. oh dear. Missing a slide. Um, later, Annie Archbold, who went to IU, former director of the Georgia Book Life Program, um, <coughs> schooled me in how to accession and archivally preserve negatives and audio tape. The media of the time in the 1980s, and of course the technology keeps evolving, but there's great value in having these primary source materials housed in institutions that accession, digitize, periodically migrate to the current technology, and make them digitally accessible in perpetuity. The reality is that many collections are housed within nonprofit organizations, and private homes at less than ideal humidity levels, and they're at risk of being damaged, discarded, or lost. And this is true of field work done by folklorists at many state arts agencies as well. It's atypical that the folklore field work I have done as an independent researcher at s or a state employee is housed in six institutional archives. The most recent is the Folk Arts and Heritage Collection, comprised by fieldwork conducted by Mass Cultural Council staff, contracted folklorists, photographers, and interns. Recordings in sound, image, and writing document traditional music and dance and material culture, as well as traditions associated with seasonal celebrations, occupational folk life, and religious practice. In 2014, we partnered with the Massachusetts State Archives to safeguard the collection. And in addition to being a resource for those whose traditions have been documented, the collection has proven essential to curating exhibitions, producing festivals, publications, and digital media. They're all ways of sharing our work with the public. One of the great joys of being a public folklorist is curating programming for the public, introducing them to craft, music, and dance traditions of which they might be unaware. Music presented on concert stages counts for a fraction of music heard and played around the world, providing high production values and technical support
to under-resourced musicians and dancers can change people's minds and hearts. Allow me to share an anecdote. A few years ago, we presented a showcase concert at the Shaylin Luke Performance Center, the Rockport. A stunning concert dinner, presenting primarily at the time classical music and jazz. Our concert, Hiding in Plain Sight, featured Dominican, West African, and South Indian, and Irish musicians and dancers. The show opened with 20 members of Association Carnivalesca de Massachusetts, processioning from the back of the hall, down the aisle, and up onto the stage. Those masqueraders were led by Stelvin Mirabal, pictured here on his front steps in Lawrence. Like many culture bearers, he dedicates countless unpaid hours to maintain Dominican carnival traditions with insufficient resources. His day job at the time of the concert was as a mechanical assembler at a manufacturing company. The day after the performance, Stelvin emailed me saying, I was received like a hero at my work on Monday. My human resources boss was on the show, at the show on Sunday, and she didn't know I was involved in the event until she saw me there. She took pictures and posted them on the company website, and everyone was congratulating me. She loved it. Thanks again for thinking of us for your show. Talk about hiding in plain sight. Right? Yeah. The driving impetus behind the 2008 exhibition, Keepers of Tradition, was twofold. To raise the visibility and employment of craftspeople and performing artists we had documented through field research, and two, to unpack and reframe how academic art history and fine art world define folk art. It was an opportunity to present objects within the cultural context of their use in annual celebrations, music making, home worship, enhancing domestic comfort and life and work on the sea. Seventy individuals shared their traditions, tunes, stories, and handmade objects. Staff at the National Heritage Museum guided us in the early stages uh, and provided expertise in designing, interpreting, and presenting over a hundred borrowed objects. And considering that many of these objects were once used in daily life, it's remarkable that so many individuals were willing to loan them for such an extended time. Having sufficient funding to hire professional photographers and a top-notch book designer um, <coughs> was invaluable. A high point was being at the opening reception where the public intermingled with the artists whose work was exhibited. What a joy it was to watch them seeing their work celebrated and so artfully displayed. We've invited many of these same individual artists to the Lowell Folk Festival, a nationally renowned event now in its 36th year. We curate the folk craft area, where artisans demonstrate skills handed down through families, like third generation ship wheel builder, Bob Fuller, and through cultural communities like recent immigrants from North India who practice the daily rituals of folk. Visitors have experienced craft traditions tied to seasonal celebrations, like the Vejigante masks of Ponce, Puerto Rico, the floral head garlands of Lithuanian Midsummer, and the crazy hat ladies of St. Peter's Italian Fiesta. <laughs> Textiles for joy and comfort like quilt making, and those associated with religious belief like the making of garments for worship art of Eastern European Pisanki and Russian icon writing, expressions of folk beauty like African American hair braiding and South Asian Mendy body art. Sometimes we focus on a single medium like paper, sharing that year uh, of Mexican pinata making, paper marbling, and children's paper work. Other times it's all about a technique like carving, where visitors met skilled craftspeople carving letter forms in stone. Japanese Buddhist sculpture, Puerto Rican um, <clears throat> santos, Chinese chops, and the decorative carving of fruit. <laughs> <laughs> After serving on an artist fellowship panel in the traditional arts, my colleague Lynn Martin Craig remarked, it's a lot of work to give away public money responsibly. <laughs> Her point? 
being stewards of public money um, requires integrity, diligence, transparency, and accountability. It's challenging to recognize, understand, and support expressive culture of all who call Massachusetts home. We must develop skills to identify how excellence is defined within somebody else's tradition. So we look to the community for guidance. What traditional art forms are revered in specific cultural communities? How is artistic excellence defined? How is an individual craftsperson, musician, or dancer regarded by other practitioners within the tradition? One of the realities of doing public folklore at a state arts agency is the call to serve the entire state. Our programs and services are funded with taxpayer dollars. We work to identify tradition bearers and support them in what we hope are meaningful ways. Those of us managing grant programs establish review criteria, we publish guidelines, process grant applications, and strive to manage a fair and equitable panel review process. But given that tradition never stands still, how is change to be understood, especially by someone outside the tradition? What happens to ancient traditions with deep roots elsewhere that are transplanted and now practiced in Massachusetts? For example, the region's growing Indian American community, whom I've come to know through their applications to support Carnotic violin and Murdungum playing, Hindustani singing and tabla playing, and Bharatanatyam dance and Odissi dance. Questions arise during panel meetings. What are we to make of an apprentice's facial expressions, which in India would be considered inappropriate for a young girl? How are we to criticize when dancers dance to recorded music? What happens to a tradition when individuals seek out government support for something that was once solely supported within the Shisha Guru tradition in preparation for an Arangetra? The Arangetram, traditionally, was an offering performed in temples, signifying the first major accomplishment in a girl or boy's life. But in the Boston area, Greater Boston, among the children of first-generation middle and upper-class immigrants employed largely in the high-tech science and medical fields, the Arangetram has become one of American largesse, evoking other cultures' rites of passage, such as a Jewish girl's bat mitzvah or a Latina's quinceanera, Arangetrams are extravagantly produced events with internationally hired musicians, glossy programs, professional videography, and abundant food. Acknowledging that the Arangetram is an important cultural phenomenon brings to light one of the challenges facing public funding and traditional arts. Apprenticeships are intended to help the continuing vitality of traditional art forms. Yet for most young Indian American students here in Massachusetts, the Aaron Getram is a form of closure rather than a beginning, as many students do not continue their intensive study after high school. So what's our role allocating limited resources? <coughs> Should financial need be a criteria in apprenticeship grants? And these are questions not just for the arts of India, but of Ireland, Cambodia, Armenia, Mali, Puerto Rico, and the countless other global traditions that find new life here in the United States. As these cultural communities become more deeply integrated and acculturated, equitable public funding of their traditional arts becomes increasingly complex. One thing I've learned from managing grant programs is that traditional artists feel duty-bound to pass on what they know, the skills they learn and master, and the lineage and lessons from whom they learned. This is true, be they Russian iconographers, letterpress printers, or bird taxidermists, Irish step dancers, Scottish bagpipers, or Cambodian dancers. Call it faithful transmission. Embodied skills can cease to exist unless they are intentionally passed on. As Howard Burnham said, I don't want to be the last book builder. Apprenticeship grants guidelines typically prioritize applications in which the mentor and the apprentice are of the same cultural background. But I wanted to question this review criteria from Tabla Virtuoso Sandeep Das, who is keen to pass his tradition on to someone outside the South Asian community. Not only is his disciple Bailey O'Donnell not Indian American, but she is also female and white. Sandeep sees the promise of breaking barriers of gender and race in Tabla performance. 
noting that after many years, so many years, those performing the highest level of Indian classical percussion are male musicians of Indian descent, he states, I wish to try and change that. And Bailey is one of my hopes. Learning a traditional art is more than just acquiring skills and honing techniques. To truly excel, one needs to be immersed within the tradition's cultural context. A student must absorb the tradition's history, aesthetics, and unspoken rules. This includes being able to identify and acquire appropriate raw materials, as well as becoming proficient in the basics before improvising in the art. Keeping a tradition going takes commitment, passion, and time. Funding helps. Since the 1970s, federal and state arts agencies have funded apprenticeships in the traditional arts. These are one-on-one -on -one mentorship grants, typically averaging 10 months, and they vary from three to six thousand dollars, a negligible sum, considering a master artist is taking valuable time away from his or her own work to mentor an apprentice. Like sign painter Josh Luke or Western bootmaker Sarah Madeline Gurin. Since establishing the apprenticeship program at Mass Cultural in 2000, I've advocated for higher funded apprenticeships, and this year the agency made its largest investment ever in traditional arts apprenticeship. $180,000 funded 18 teams at $10,000 each. And these are two-year grants, which means, assuming that next year's state appropriation allows, each apprenticeship will have received $20,000. Helping carry traditional knowledge forward may be one of the most significant things public folklorists do. And now to close. There was a time in the late 1980s when as a newly degreed folklorist, all the tradition bearers I sought out to interview and learn from were decades older than I was. They were the age of my own grandparents. Time <coughs> passed, contract field work turned into salary positions at state arts agencies, and I relocated from the deep south back home to the northeast and dug into the folk culture of Massachusetts. 10 years into the work, I noticed that there were no longer decades of lived experience between myself and most of the people I was interviewing. We were, in fact, cohorts in age. It's been 24 years since I came to manage the Folk Arts and Heritage Program in Massachusetts. And recently, I found myself sitting across from a Nepalese Sarandi player, a Tascam DR100 recording device in my hand, listening to him talk of his experience integrating to the US. Photos of his young daughter were taped to the wall of the family's sparsely furnished apartment. It was only after I asked him what year he was born that I realized he was 20 years younger than I was. I've gone from being a youngster interviewing <coughs> elders, to interviewing people of my own generation, to the odd sensation of realizing that I'm older than many of the people with whom I engage. I suppose it's the opposite experience of academics who find themselves in classrooms each fall filled with students who stay the same age. <laughs> I'm encouraged by the growing number of IU graduates holding state folklore positions. You will find new ways of working. And if I had a wish for the future of this work, it would be for more collaboration among tradition bearers, artists, community scholars, and those trained in ethnographic fieldwork and grounded in the academic disciplines of folklore and musicology and related fields of study. We can learn from one another. We need each other. Future generations will thank us. Thank you.
uh, through museums and festivals and other performances. And I, I'm thinking about Bal Piate in particular and artists like him who um, at least sometimes are kind of forced by necessity to travel these commercial circuits that are very much marked by like very fraught world music um, narratives that can be very essentializing and how, how difficult it is for their press teams to get away from those narratives at times. And at times, but I'm, I'm wondering um, if and how you've seen public folklore and ethnomusicology kind of influence or interact with uh, those kinds of narratives in the, the commercial music public sphere. Yeah, I mean, my, my experience is mostly with the National Council for Traditional Arts, mm -hmm. if you're familiar with them. And they're really great because when they present, they bring in folklorists and ethnomusicologists to do that interpretive stuff. So what you're saying is not happening in the places I've seen. You know, is also a member of the Silk Road that Yo-Yo Ma started. I don't think he's being compromised. And he's, he's performing it, I think he's performed at Indiana University. Yeah. Um, yeah. But there is this thing happening now in, in major halls where it's becoming like this world music thing. And I, I just, I'm not aware of how they're being presented. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they're being compromised. I hope not. Thank you. Yeah. Here's this artist who's saying, no, 
that's not important as important to me. So I don't know. Yeah. I think this will tie into that question. Uh, many times we look at the folk arts, and the folk arts we end up serving um, communities that are often overlooked or underserved by the rest of the arts right. council agency. Right. Uh, we're at a juncture now where the arts agencies are starting to rethink the canon of music, think about where they're putting the money. And all of a sudden, many of the traditional arts that we've worked with and we call, oh, these, this is a folk arts. Right. Maybe we've taken care of them for a while, but maybe they should be part of the general arts category where there's more funding and more opportunities. Or maybe they're going to be this and that at, at some point. No, you can point. put your finger on it. And that's why, but that's why I mentioned the thing about it's all art. It, it's really tricky. And, and if you, some people are saying they want to get rid of evaluative stuff like we're, you're, if you're a cultural practitioner you can apply for funding and it's not even going to be in a discipline so i really don't know how it's all going to shake out um and it's true we took care of all the people that weren't getting funded for a long time right maybe 40 years um and our budgets have grown at least mine has not not all around the country but going forward i don't know how it's we need new ideas Well, thank you. You've been a great audience.